Hello and welcome to New England Authors. It's so good to have you here. We explore different uh, subjects. We explore authors and writers from around New England. And we're, today we're going to be talking about autism. We have with us uh, two very special guests, John Summer. Um, thank you, John, for being here. And who is the person to your left, your daughter? This is, uh, this is Nusha Summers, um, nine years old almost 10 in the fourth grade at Cambridgeport Elementary School. Welcome, Nusha. It's so good to have you. You know, I've interviewed um, children's authors, right, uh, people who write children's books and young adult books, but I've never had an actual young adult here with us. So all my authors are um, at 30s, 40s, 70s, uh, and so it's really nice to have you here. Thank you. So. Um, uh, before we get started, we're going to talk about autism because you are, are uh, you work on education and autism, and um, and in the process of funding Lingua Franca Media. So tell us first of all, what is autism? I thought you were going to ask what is Lingua Franca. Oh, I could ask, I could ask <laughs> um, that too. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, both of them are somewhat open ended at the moment. Uh -huh. um, it's a more difficult question uh, with respect to autism than. It may seem um, the metaphor that is used to diagnose the disorder, which is sometimes referred to as ASD, is that of a spectrum, which most I think people have heard of. Right. It's coined by a British psychologist in the 80s. So it encompasses a wide range of uh, behaviors. Um, one of the most common to every part of the spectrum is a somewhat impaired form of social reciprocity, some in inability to or some disturbance in the ability to recognize social cues and to um, conform to expectations. Mm -hmm. um, um, so um, the latest uh, edition of the DSM at one point had included uh, autism along with Asperger's. Right. Asperger's is mixed and it's folded in to autism. As part, as the end of the spectrum, right? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. It, uh, but it's not at all clear, I think, that um, although the behaviors that are described under the diagnostic criteria are fairly recognizable um, now at this point because there's a heightened awareness, it's not yet clear um, w w if we're using the right word. Um, my son's neuropsychological examiner, for example, at the Lurie Center for Autism um, in Lexington, which is one of the premier clinics in the country, confided to me in a kind of, you know, on the way out the door. Uh -huh. It's not really clear that autism is what your son has, although clearly he's oh, got I in the spectrum. I so see. Yeah. There yeah. are some um, diagnoses that uh, incorporate a speech uh, impairment. So, for example, my son, Anusha's brother, um, is what they call nonverbal. So he doesn't speak. And there's yeah. a certain percentage of children and adults who are diagnosed with autism who don't speak. They are... Uh, by definition, considered moderate to severe. But then, of course, on the other end of the spectrum, what's sometimes referred to as the high-functioning part of the spectrum, yes. we have very remarkable and intelligent people writing books and, and advocating in the world Absolutely. and doing all kinds of interesting, yeah. wonderful things. Yeah. So um, when was, how old is your son now? Um, he is six. He'll be seven in November. And when was he diagnosed with? Uh, with 2000, uh, he was three. Uh-huh. Uh, how did you know? What were the, what were the symptoms? Well, um, Nusha will speak to this in a minute because I think maybe she knew something before we did. She's very well, perceptive. And, you know. What did you notice, Nusha? Well, um, my mom and dad, they thought that he was deaf and because he wasn't really speaking back to them. But um, he, we... He was starting to know something very strange, and when he went to the doctor, he when we came back, we finally realized that he had autism. And there is one thing thing that um, people always they forget about, and they always think it's different, but they always think that it's a sickness and a disease, but it's not. It's a disorder. It's something that they can't do, because as uh, my dad said. Autism has many different symptoms and effects. Yeah. So what's the di difference between a disease and a disorder? Well, um, 
I would say that a disease is basically like a, um, well, it's hard to explain. It's kind it's of like a sickness. It's a tough question, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, one would think that a, um, maybe a disease is something that has a very clear uh, procedure of treatment that um, could be um, at least managed in its symptoms, if not cured. Yeah. Um, whereas a disorder is um, um, something else, perhaps, that is best reflected by its outward expressions, such as behavior, which is a very big category for the yes. treatment of children with autism. You were talking about um, the sociability aspect. That's a very central part of it. Um, how does that manifest? A lack of sociability or what? Well, um, um, as Nusha said, at one point, um, you know, we, you're standing at the door to the bedroom and call out his name and his back is to us, but he doesn't respond. But it turns out his hearing is fine. Um, so um, he now responds to his name. His eye contact is quite good. With some uh, children, eye contact is a major um, a metric or factor in, yeah. in, in, in determining um, um, the degree of severity of, of autism. Um, some children have tantrums and seizures and uh, you know hide in the corner and um, have varying levels of what the jargon yes. calls um, frustration tolerance. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. that's a frustration De decreased tolerance, frustration yeah. tolerance. Oh, I right? see. I see. Yes. Um, so. Um, um, our 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 uh, boy is um, is quite affectionate and has wonderful sense of humor uh -huh. and um, is very lovely and he, although he's not verbal he's quite noisy he makes I see. A, does he makes a lot of sounds doesn't he he squawks and he squeals and he shrieks yeah and he screams mm -hmm. and um, depending on since we've been with him for about six years now we can identify, because when he squeals, we can identify if it's a mad or an excited squeal. And he usually flaps his arms and it's... it's um, That's his form of expression. Yes. So, um, uh, Nusha, you uh, read something to the uh, City Hall on the occasion of Autism Awareness Day. And it was it's a beautiful thing. Do you think you could read it for us now? Of course, yes. Yeah. Um, I had a shock when I found my brother, Misha, has autism. My father and my mother thought Misha might be deaf. They didn't know why he wasn't responding to them. When we went to the doctor, she said that my brother has autism. We started, him, we started treating him very differently than we did before, in a way that he was very special. I didn't understand it. I was really confused. You might think that we treat people with autism like any other people, but I don't think so. That's not true. People with autism should be treated specially, not like every other person. Misha needs to be treated specially because he could be really he could hurt, be hurt really fast. He has more sensitive senses than other people. I think people with autism don't have the protection they need. They're walking on the sidewalk and see a road. They don't know to look both ways before crossing. One time, my brother bolted from my dad's hand and ran into the middle of the street. Um, I think police should be trained to understand people with autism better. Will children with autism get lost or separated from their families? Police don't know how to approach them. Police don't know if they're mad, upset, confused, or hurt. Police should be ready. Uh, for example, last summer a child with autism got lost in Cambridge. The police didn't know how to approach him. He couldn't talk, and so he couldn't say who he was or where his parents were. People with autism should be cared for. Sometimes children with autism get bullied, and that is basically wrong. One time he got bullied. Um, that person pushed my brother around. Mm. Imagine if you were the one passing a classroom and everyone laughs at you. Mm. People with autism are special, intelligent, and nice. They have talents nobody else has. They are unique in many different ways. 
People may not know that yet, but all those qualities are always inside. My brother is one of the most important people of my life. He is sick and he, he is six and he is just beginning to say his first words. I know those words will be truly intelligent. It may be frustrating sometimes, but I will never give up. Well, thank you so much. That was, uh, this is New England Authors, and uh, we have, we're talking about autism. We have uh, John Summer and his daughter Nusha here with us uh, to talk about that. And uh, that was very beautifully read. What, what do you, uh, you, you mentioned intelligent, John, you, you alluded to this earlier. Um, uh, people with autism are intelligent, aren't they? Did they have uh, communication difficulties? Is that a good way of summarizing it, or, or too simplistic? Um, everything is too simplistic with autism. I mean, <laughs> nothing is uh, is exactly right, whether it's uh, the wrong word we're using or whether it's autisms. Um, every child is um, has its, um, a unique expression of um, who he or she is, and um, you know when the child can't speak, it does present some pretty significant challenges. Um, for example, it's unclear whether uh, Misha uh, has the words and the thoughts, uh, you know, in the throat and ready to express them, but can't make his muscles move and can't his neurological system can't connect his thoughts to his um, um, to his mouth and his gross motor movements and his fingers and his fine motor movements because you see it expressed all over the body in different mm. ways um, or if he doesn't have those thoughts I mean it's 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 um, or if he has the thoughts that are in um, re refracted through his own dimensions of, of time and space it's it's unclear mm. so it really exercises the imagination yeah. when you're living in a home with a child mm. um, it, it's a wonderful training for the imagination, I should say. Now, people with uh, disabilities um, have a problem getting around. And also, um, maybe uh, when you go into a restaurant, or, uh, people look at you funny or, or, uh, or try to avoid uh, uh, looking at you. Do you notice that? Um, well, there was a time when we were just leaving to go to Ocean City, New Jersey, and we were at a restaurant. But... Um, when Misha was little, he liked playing with a lot of lights. Lights were his specialty. He liked flicking uh, lights on and off with the switch, and it was very um, interesting for him. And so we were at the restaurant, and my dad went in line to get a snack for us. And we were sitting at the table when suddenly there was a light over us. He stood up and tampered with the light. Uh -huh. He tried to... Uh, touch it and play with it. Um, everybody was trying not to be involved with it. Uh. And we were trying to get him to stop. And uh, right now, Misha's at a stage when he pulls hair. And that's a very alarming situation for him to be in and yeah. for other people. So, uh, he, and he stood up to pull my hair. And then we had a little uh, fight at the restaurant, mm. which was kind of hard to um, get him tangled out of. So we are just trying to um, help him not do that right now. Right, right. Nusha brings up, I'm sorry. If you, Go ahead. Nusha brings up a number of really interesting things in that anecdote. Um, yes, he was standing up and trying to swat at these overhead lights. And I, I think people are, are Remarkably tolerant, yes, and and at, at the very least, extremely well practiced in hiding their intolerance. Yes, uh -huh, because we uh -huh. don't get a lot of um, um, we don't get a lot of problems in that respect. Uh, and when we do, uh, when Misha is disruptive uh, in a public setting, um, what's our rule? We um, w we never apologize for Misha. Uh huh. Never. Oh, Why uh, would that's, we? That's, that's Why would we? But we, but we do apologize for some specific specific action that he takes, and like yeah. grabbing somebody's hair. That is yeah. worth apologizing for because it's an infraction in the code. Uh -huh. But Misha is Misha, and uh, we can't apologize for that mm -hmm. because people. Um, it's a learning process every day with him and his behavior. So she mentions the hair pulling, which has started recently. 
So it's widely understood by behavioral therapists in this field that things like hair pulling are not symptoms of aggression. They're what they call attention-seeking behaviors. Oh. So if you react to the hair pulling, you um, re reward the behavior. Oh, I see. And I accentuate see. it. And because when he, when he pulls your hair, he does it and he gets a big smile. Uh -huh. okay, and he looks for someone <laughs> to notice that he's doing it. Uh -huh. He's not attempting to hurt her. Now that's all well and good in the home. And Nusha is remarkably patient and, and helpful in not right. reinforcing the behavior. But when you're in a restaurant, it's a little bit harder to, for other people to understand that this behavior, which is obviously upsetting or alarming, as Nusha said, is not what it seems to be. Yeah. Now, we had uh, a long time ago to talk. I just wanted to talk a little political here. We had a long time ago the American with Disabilities Act, which is just a wonderful thing for um, senior citizens as well as disabled people. We have uh, um, uh, the curbs uh, for wheelchair ramps, which are great for not just people with wheelchairs, but for senior citizens, for uh, women with uh, uh, baby carriages and uh, buses that uh, go down um, and uh, better bathrooms and so on. Um, some of that is under threat now, isn't it? Some of the funding, some of the, the uh, consideration for uh, people with disabilities. Can you talk about that a bit? Well, it's uh, the doctrine of reasonable accommodation, right, is the, emerged from the Americans with Disabilities Act and then was extended into um, the educational portion of the act where every child which is, who's been diagnosed with a, a disability has the same right to a free and equivalent education as any other American citizen, mm -hmm. um, or, and non-citizens, I should add, as well. Um, and so uh, the law stands, but the enforcement is a different thing, and the funding of it, as you also say, is a, it's completely um, discouraging. The, the Trump administration, I suppose almost needless to say in this community, is um, uh, doing everything it can to uh, gut the act and to gut the funding and the enforcement. In fact, the entire effort in the education department is to attack the public and the democratic foundations of American education, which have been in place for quite a long time, and to... Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, could, uh, give us uh, an example of this. Uh, you were talking about uh, transportation. Um, tra uh, oh, in the, in the essay? Yes. Talk a little about transportation. You had uh, you had a situation where uh, um, you, so uh, your son had to wait like um, two hours in order to get uh, to get a ride to go one mile, something like that. Well, um, yeah, so I wrote an essay about the issues of transporting my son from um, home to his school in Cambridge, and the. It's struggling for what seemed a, a, a reasonable commute for a child who cannot speak and uh, can't speak up for himself and wouldn't really benefit from commuting very long. I discovered a lot of things, and one of them is that there's an administrative regulation in Massachusetts that allows for um, uh, children to be um, uh, uh, transported from home to school with a, a maximum of one hour each way. Uh -huh. uh, this is it, it's. Not intuitive because most school transportation works through neighborhoods. Yes. Okay, but disabled children are scattered randomly around the different cities, and they're not clustered in one neighborhood. So um, there needs to be a, a, really a separate transportation system and vendor to to accommodate them. So mm -hmm. um, we do live 1.1 miles away from the school, and it was a struggle to um, try to define in his which is called his IEP, his Individualized Education Program, um, the limits of his, uh, by which he could be, the limits of his transportation, and they refused to do it. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. very frustrating. I understand why they didn't want to set a precedent, but um, on the merits, it seemed uh, like an easy one. Who benefits from commuting one hour each way? Um, you know, Massachusetts is a really wonderful place to discuss and talk about special education because the government, the Commonwealth, I should, I should say, is quite good. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I mean, this is a great place. Mo yeah, most New England states are. Yeah. So, if the way things aren't working here, I think is very instructive. Um, and I should also say, 
um, I've been very outspoken in advocating for Misha, as is uh, Nusha, um, with the school district, um, with his uh, clinicians and his providers. And the struggles that I've had, which include spending approximately 30 to 35 percent of my time on paperwork, the Paperwork yeah. Reduction Act would be fantastic. It would <laughs> immediately increase retention rates for special education teachers. Yeah, you, you, you have a quote here. My <laughs> kindergartner gets classroom services of 220 total minutes, and transporting him a mile might take more than 600. <laughs> you also note that, quote, such a f um, avoidable ailments fall disproportionately on children more so on children from poorer families that cannot afford private transportation, and most of all on anxiety-prone, nonverbal children with autism like my son. You want to comment on that a little bit? Well, um, in respect of where the faults in the system fall disproportionately, um, that seems self-evidently true. Um, imagine if you were a child who can't speak or express himself, and you're being, you know, driven around all over the city. You don't know how long you're getting there. You might not be exactly sure where you're going. There might be a driver who's um, eating a McDonald's in the car, and you might have a um, or breakfast, and you might have um, sensitivities to that kind of pungent smell. Yeah. It might make you very uncomfortable. Yeah. The radio might be turned up to a frequency that might really make your teeth chatter, yeah. and you can't express it. The longer the commute is, the more likely that things like this can happen. And you know. A, a, commute longer than 30 minutes is not good for a normal, typical, healthy adult. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems uh, uh, transportation is defined in special education law as a related service. But it's an area that not a lot of attention has been given to, although some has. Um, and um, I was going to say that when you know, writing letters and emails, you know, endless emails and filing complaints and writing letters to the editor and trying to put this issue on the map, it just occurred to me that an awful lot of my son's um, classmates have parents who are not native English speakers. So I have no trouble speaking up and speaking English and talking the bureaucratic jargon of mm. the people that I'm trying to get something from. Yeah. But many other, many other families, if I'm struggling with these things, I know that they're struggling. Yes, they do, or they yes. may not, the, things may be happening to their children that they're not even aware of. And, you know, and then we talk about like what happens in Arkansas or in Texas, where many, many fewer people are even trying. I see. Um, I see. And it's very distressing to think mm. about this. What would you want us to know? What do you want us to know about autism? How could we be? How could we be helpful? Well, um, first, I just I, w I want people to think that it's not a disease; it's a disorder, of course. And um, second, I want people to know not to be embarrassed of them, not to keep them into hiding. And for parents who actually have people, uh, sons or daughters of autism, not to keep them in hiding. And I want them to be out in the open, actually, and trying to make the world a better difference. Because people might know or not that <coughs> People with autism, they have a lot more intelligence than people think, and they should be more appreciated because of that. Um, they they should be more noticed, and they um, I bet they would like that, of course. Um, but nobody can actually know what people with autism that are nonverbal what they're thinking, of right. course. Right. But just a couple of times, Misha will just, um, words will slip out. He can say purple, um, that one time actually slipped out. And his first two that's syllable purple. word. Oh, that's a, that's a great, that's the first word or? No. It's, no. Was no. actually, yeah. when he was eating meatballs, he said meatball. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, John. I want to ask you, um, uh, what's next? Please tell us about your past, your present, your future, uh, your work, your writings. I know you're writing uh, uh, about this subject, um, and uh, what, you, what you're involved in, 
what is uh, lingua franca media, which we haven't talked about, and, uh, and uh, the books that you're underway huh. with. So, it, so you're confirming I have a future? <laughs> yeah. this, is, uh, this is news, I'll note that. Okay. Um, I am, uh, you know, devote the preponderance of my time to caring uh, for and learning from the children, Anusha and her brother, um, working from home. Um, and um, at the same time, I've started a research institute called Lingua Franca Media, which is focused on education uh, and focused on radical theories of education um, that are not being discussed and why they're not being discussed. The, the institutions that we have of uh, education um, from elementary school uh, to um, graduate school are all lie within our scope of research. We'll be uh, announcing the beginning of the um, institute in a public way early next year. In the meantime, I'm working on a book, biography of a sociologist named C. Wright Mills, died in 1962. Oh. And um, I'm also working on a, on a memoir, which is uh, titled uh, Nobody Talks. Uh, it's an uh, effort to pointed. stitch together some personal anecdotes and incidences with Okay. Um, the current. Well, that's a great way to wrap up here. Mm -hmm.